so hi again. I'm wired up again. <laughs> for uh, so, as as we talked yesterday, we we are uh, we were planning for a session on optimizations. Uh, it's really how to write code on multi-core CPUs. It's not just the DPDK. It's nice it's not just Intel CPUs. It's it applies to DPDK in general on any CPU. Uh, so I have a number of things here that I want to go through and uh, then we can go through other questions, other questions that people might have about DPDK optimizations in general. Um, so what I have here is uh, a tentative list of uh, hardware features that are important, are relevant to code optimizations and also uh, number of software techniques that we can use for optimizations. Obviously, it's not an exhaustive list, and the purpose is not to create an exhaustive list. We can start writing a book, and then we'll see what happens. But <laughs> that's a massive undertaking. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we can make some money out of this. OK, so um, in terms of hardware features, obviously, uh, I mean, uh, we talked about huge pages, uh, why they are relevant, why they are important for uh, performance, why we should use them. I think that's, that should be clear to everybody at this point, uh, if it was not even before, before that. Um, we talked about prefetching. There are actually two types of prefetchers. There, there are the hardware prefetchers. MJ knows everything about them. Uh, and uh, you have the software prefetchers, which are basically the prefetch instructions, the three, four, five prefetch instructions that you might have different flavors of that. So uh, hardware prefetchers are kind of hardware blocks that are uh, could be enabled or disabled through BIOS. Most of them, I'm, I'm actually not sure if you can do that for all of them. What they will do is they will train for patterns in the code. I mean, as you access memory, they will try to detect patterns. Like if you are accessing every second cache line, every 57 cache line, they would try to lock on that and prefetch automatically that next cache line, hoping that that's exactly what you are going to read next. Sometimes they are not working. They, they are. Uh, um, impacting the performance in a negative way. So you might have to disable them, especially if you, uh, for, for packet processing, where what we do all day long is we look up into tables, usually big tables. We do lookups uh, based on hashing or LPM or ACL or whatever. And then we get some, some result, some data that we use to, to do the next read. We, we do some actions on the packet, and then we go to read the next table. And all these things are kind of, you can see a data dependency between all these things. You, it's data dependent reads. You cannot really start all the reads in parallel. You need to do the first read to understand where ex what exactly is the address where you need to read next from. So there is a data dependency problem. Um, Intel Data Direct IO, this is like an Intel feature. Uh, I think we talked about this is kind of, um, reserving a portion of the of the last level cache for IO devices, which are typically NICs. Whatever sits on the PCI bus uh, will get a special treatment. The, they, they, will, they will get these lanes, um, these, uh, sorry, these ways of the cache, of the last level cache assigned to that and used exclusively by those devices. Um, this goes actually hand in hand with the next thing, Intel Cache Allocation Technology, um, which is a feature on the latest Intel CPU, server class CPUs, which would do the same for CPU cores. So the way it works is like you define, there are um, uh, uh, several classes, uh, they, I think they call, it, uh, they call them classes, or groups, I'm, I don't remember exactly. I think it's groups, of course. You, could, you can define, OK, I, I want this. Uh, so right now, I think it, it works uh, per, per CPU cores. Going forward, uh, once uh, um, we get some support implemented in Linux kernel, it could actually work per thread. But right now, it's per CPU core. So the way it works, you, could, you define groups of CPU cores. And then you, you say uh, you allocate cache ways to each of these groups. So basically, uh, let's say you have cores 1, 2, and 3 on one group and cores 4 and 5 on a different group. You allocate different cache ways to them. 
So basically those three cores that are part of that group would share those cache, those cache ways. And the, 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 the cores on, on a different group will, will share whatever ways are allocated to, 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 to that group. So, I mean, you can imagine a typical setup where you dedicate some ways to I.O., you dedicate some ways to your workers, to your data plane cores, and then you dedicate something to the Linux core where you run the Linux operating system and you run whatever um, slower processing, whether it's control plane. I'm not sure that these days control plane is actually that slow processing anymore. But you can do that. Uh, so that's actually very powerful. And uh, the reason to use that is uh, it, will, uh, it will add determinism to your application. So you can imagine you have some applications where uh, that, I mean, you can imagine you have several applications, several applications running on different CPU cores that are all hang hungry, competing for last level cache. Um, so they will thrash the L3, the last level cache, L3 cache in this case, for each other. So then it would make sense if you could keep them separate using different, uh, different parts of the last level cache. Um, so what you could actually do is you can tune your application. You can just uh, start with all the cores sharing the entire, all the ways of the L3 cache, and then you start uh, gradually reducing that. And you could actually detect that equilibrium point where uh, like your noisy neighbor type of application that will impact your data plane is assigned some cache ways uh, and you will assign the minimal number of cache ways that would allow you to, let's say, get 90% of the performance that you were getting in the case where the, the whole cache was successful, right? So you will find the best compromise that would, uh, that would have minimal impact for, for, all of, for, for uh, each of them. Uh, we have vector instructions. Not sure if that's a hardware feature or a software feature. I mean, uh, it's a hardware feature, but you need to use it. You enable it through software. If you don't write the software, uh, then it, usually it's tricky. It, it won't be picked up by compilers. Sometimes compilers will optimize your code, will use the vector instructions. Uh, but if you really uh, want to get the best out of them, uh, like for example, you have uh, ACL library in DPDK and vector Polmo driver in DPDK, you can actually think everything as a stream of vector instructions and uh, basically create a new algorithm, a new, completely new way of, of handling that problem with these special instructions. <coughs> Last but not, uh, not least, you have all these features on the NIC side that we should try to, to uh, make the best out of them. Uh, so we talked yesterday about RSS, receive side scaling, and flow director, which are uh, features on Intel NICs. Uh, I think that uh, similar features are available on other NICs from other vendors. Um, the challenge here, at least for NFV, is how can we create a generic interface to leverage these hardware offloads that is portable across different uh, generations of the same NIC and different uh, NICs from different vendors. That's a challenge. I actually personally, I don't see how this could happen without defining some standards, like you have the VertIO or whatever standard. Can we actually define some standards for some NIC offload features that are, let's say, mainstream and should behave the same, should look the same on all the NICs? Obviously, that's not gonna happen overnight. It's something like it will be a very time-consuming effort, but I think we need to go that way to define some standards if we really want these things to, to work seamlessly. Okay, in terms of software techniques, um, just a few, a few that most of the people in this room are already aware of. So. Create affinity between your software threads and your hardware, hardware cores, hardware threads, hyper threads. Uh, why is that? Because you, uh, I mean, you have, to, you have to do several things here. Uh, so first of all, uh, why are we doing this? Uh, the reason is we don't want a, a data plane thread to be swapped in and out from that core by the Linux scheduler, right? Because uh, you, you will start a, th a thread here on this core. It will actually 
install whatever data structure it needs to, to install into the cache, and then you are swapping it out, you get another thread who, need, who needs another, uh, some other data structure, so it will thrash the cache for, for the previous thread. Um, so it's like uh, you are hitting yourself uh, pretty hard here. So what you need to do is you need to use that uh, uh, kernel feature, Linux kernel feature called ISOL CPU to kind of say, hey, uh, Linux scheduler, please keep away from these cores. I, I'm going to manage them myself. And then you need to, uh, to allocate something on those, uh, to, to, to map some threads to those cores which are left out of the scheduler. And usually you do that, uh, you do uh, one thread per core. I think in uh, DPDK, uh, in the recent times, maybe last couple of years or maybe less than that, uh, there were an, uh, a number of customers asking us to enable this usage where you have multiple threads, multiple POSIX threads assigned to the same core. Obviously, at the, at the expense of performance. So that's also possible, but if, you, if your primary goal is performance, then you shouldn't do that. Um, so actually, maybe go to the next slide. <coughs> So are there alternatives to, to this uh, that, that would, um, to, to the core thread affinity that would not affect performance uh, that much? So uh, recently there were some um, new approaches implemented in DPDK which would allow you to do that. So I'm not sure if you guys saw in uh, DPDK release uh, 2.2, uh, there, there is a sample application called performance threads. So what that does is, is implementing lightweight threads. Um, it wasn't accepted as a library, as a generic library, so it was, we had to do it as a sample application. But if you look inside that application, you'll see that there is very, there is, uh, uh, most of the code is generic and is put in a separate folder, is like a library. So what that does is the, the classical uh, coroutines, where you actually have several functions that are that you could, can think of as being threads, and they are running as part of the same POSIX thread, which is mapped to the same, to, to, uh, to, it's mapped by itself to a hardware core. Uh, so what you are doing is these threads have to be cooperative. So uh, they will uh, be granted the CPU, they will run for a while, and then once they complete whatever they were supposed to complete, which doesn't need to, uh, uh, which has to be uh, relatively short, it, so that you don't hog the CPU for too much, you don't, you don't starve the other threads. So once you reach a reasonable point, you will call yield yourself. So you are, by your, you, you are cooperative and you are willingly releasing the CPU to other threads. So you have this scheduling done with minimal, let's say, effort. What we do is we simply save the context of the current thread. We just save a few registers. And then we load the context of the other so-called lightweight thread. So that's, that's, uh, that's one approach. The other approach that is um, more closer and dear to my heart, because <laughs> I implemented it, is um, in this uh, IP pipeline application. Uh, and uh, what we have there is these uh, so-called uh, pipelines, which are really just, uh, let's say, functional blocks that are implemented in a standard way using input ports, tables, and output ports connected together. You just set up some action handlers there. So basically, you get for free an infrastructure. You don't need to write code to move the packets yourself. And it's very clear just looking into that code, which are your tables. You don't need to uh, just um, go very deep into the code to see, oh, actually, this function is an LPM lookup or whatever hash lookup. This is, so that means that there is a table somewhere here. No, you, you, you will see like uh, instantly which are your tables, how many of them you have, how they are interconnected. So um, typically a thread is something that uh, works on the boundary of instructions. So a, a, a thread is a stream of instructions. Uh, which is fine, which is perfect for, let's say, generic approaches where you don't really know which uh, is the real workload that you are doing. But here we know that we are processing packets. 
So, so why break on the boundary of instructions when we know that we have packets? Why not break on the boundary of packets? Uh, and uh, more exactly, why not break on the boundary of bursts of packets? Because we run with multiple packets at a time. So what we do here is like we have these pipelines uh, and uh, each one has, it's run in an automatic way using a function called RT pipeline run. What that will do is actually will read a burst of packets from one of the input ports, will run with those packets until uh, they are dropped or they are sent out. So until the processing is completed on those packets. Um, so what we have actually implemented in a very, very uh, quick way in, in this application is a, a mechanism of scheduling. So what we do is we, we can actually assign each of these pipelines to uh, a different CPU core, we can, um, or we can map several of them to the same core. So it's pretty instant, straightforward to write a very simple, trivial scheduler that would just iterate through these pipelines, will just run one iteration of data plane for each of these pipelines, and then once in a while in a very, uh, let's say, relatively infrequently long periods of time, it will also look for configuration messages. You'll have some, besides your packet queues, you'll have some message queues where you have configuration messages, like what we call in VPP like DAPI, to, to send like update routes, FIBs, update uh, classifier entries, so on and so forth. Good question. Can you yeah. talk a little about what, what you're exactly doing in... At this level, I didn't think of, of, of it that way. So for me, a pipeline, although it's called a pipeline, the reason it's called a pipeline is because internally it's like a chain of tables. It comes from open flow, right? Mm -hmm. But it, uh, it's, at the end of the day, what it is, it's like a task. It's like a functional block. So what I wanted to achieve is be able to map, like make this, make, make this uh, topology. If you look at the two things, they are identical in terms of topology. You have some... Uh, uh, NICs connected to these uh, hardware blocks, which are uh, to these functional blocks, which are connected through software queues, and then they are connected to some output NICs. Um, the only difference here versus here is like how you map it to CPU cores. So what I wanted to make sure is that I could assign each pipeline to any CPU core, mm -hmm. and I will leave this to the user. So I, you can do the topology, and then it's up to you to kind of. We actually have a script internally that we plan to upstream, which will generate all these combinations of possibilities, which, I, which is actually growing exponentially, uh, given a, a number of pipelines and the number of CPU cores, how can you map all of these things? So uh, the thing is, uh, you can do that analytically, or you can do that through brute force, and you could determine like, hey, this is the best mapping. So that was my primary concern to be able to, to map this to uh, each, to map a pipeline to any CPU core uh, and leave this balancing of work maybe to the user or to the brute force process. Yeah, I, I got to the point where I concluded that, it, that such a scheme would work really well as long as the one pointy hair, hair, you know, hatted wizard who understood it could be put in a box and shipped FedEx to every place that it was going to be used. And that the second the workload changes, you end up with trouble there. I mean, I, uh, literally, literally yes. I've tried it. The other thing that happens, you're not saying much about, is when you hop from core to core, you take exactly the, you know, you take exactly the pounding and the cash that you were describing a minute ago on the previous yes. slide. That's my next slide, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so that, that's that's exactly right. The thing is, uh, CPUs will also improve on the core to core transfers. Obviously, uh, it will it will take uh, it will take a cost every time you have to to to, uh, to communicate through this uh, one core needs to send packets to another core. As I was saying as well, uh, was it two days ago? Um, what we see right now is that it's actually very beneficial to have a, a small pipeline of uh, logical cores where the two logical cores are actually hyperthreads of the same physical core because then you don't have to go. So yeah, then, the you're not, then you're not thrashing the L2 and yes. above. Yeah. Yes. Got so, it. So how, that's, how, that's many, one. how many clocks do you typically use in one of these? Uh, you know, in one of these uh, micro pipelines. You know, how, you know, in other, you know, in other words, from from RX to TX. You know, how many clocks are you chewing up? So it, it actually depends on what you are doing. I mean, yeah. we have like flow classification. This is just one table. It's a hash table. 
Uh, and, okay, uh, so that's, depending on the size of the table, what, 30 yeah. blocks of Well, in, in our world, uh, at least in this, what we have is we just have some example pipelines. I mean, we, we build the infrastructure for people to write pipelines, uh, write these blocks. Uh, we just provide some examples. Like here is like an example flow classification. Maybe it's not that realistic. In, in the routing pipeline, for example, you have two tables. You have an LPM table and you have a hash table for ARP, which you can enable, you could disable. This, yeah. is, this is what we do. So uh, what I realized is that if I want to build some examples, if I want to build some reusable blocks, I cannot put too many tables in, in, uh, in one of these pipelines. Uh, so like what I was thinking today when you were presenting your uh, classifier is that it actually looks very similar to this concept of creating chaining tables together that we have as part of, uh, of, yeah. of, uh, of some of our libraries that we call packet frames. So I'm, uh, I'm going to spend definitely more time to look into the classifier, the VBB classifier, yeah, and you the know, and all again, the Again, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not at all religious about the, about the lookup and matching yeah. method. It's more the, you know, oh, and by the way, you know, next index to, you know, to do, to do graph trajectory steering. That, 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 you know, that's pretty well a proven technique. We, yeah. we do it in so many different places and yeah. ways. It's a good technique to mix, mix with VPP. The, the, actual, the actual match engine, I have no agenda about yes. it. If you can come up with a better one, no, and no, I'm no, sure I, there is one, I, I, I'd love to see it. First, I need to learn what you guys are doing. I, I, I know that it's really no. good stuff, so, so I'm not criticizing it in any way. So no, I need no, to learn no, it I, first. This, isn't, this is just... Yeah. You know, this this is about places where I have, you know, I, you know, I do have a little bit of an agenda because I kind of know what's going to work with the rest of the, yes. you know, the, the rest of the great un unwashed in terms yes. of, you know, a pretty, you know, a pretty fully fleshed out net stack. But Probably we need to, to talk a bit more of, offline mm -hmm. about these things. I'd like to understand your concerns, like the things that you met and uh, maybe also uh, things that you'd like us to measure and see. May I'm sure there are good ideas in what we did as well. Yeah. Maybe we can yeah, move no, some no, of the, the concepts in here or the other way around. Yes. You know, cer certainly, the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the coroutine threads is one that actually is used in VPP, but really only, only on the control plane core. You know, okay. The typical use there is to say, I need to send a packet every five seconds or every 50 milliseconds for you know, BFD or something. We do, we do that, again, out of a single core where you know, we're just scheduling with that jump long jump effect. Yeah, we were thinking like w one potential use case for them would be uh, in a host stack where you are actually terminating um, a socket connection. Yeah, and yeah. most of the time, those sockets are inactive. Yeah. So, so maybe you can have a dispatcher there that could uh, uh, wake up uh, the, 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 the lightweight thread that is attached to a socket, that is serving a socket. Yeah, the question is how much, you know, if, if you have 50, you know, 500,000 or a million flows, how many, you know, how many bytes of stack space are you going to blow that way? Yeah, be, yes. But on the other hand, you cannot afford to have 500, uh, half a million POSIX threads. You could, however, probably uh, afford to have half a million of lightweight threads because they are not yeah, consuming the, anything. The quite, you know, Classically, that, that stuff's done with state machines kind of on purpose, you know, and that, that kind of state machine programming is just a real pain compared to cooperating multitasking threads. Yes, and it's also an application change to, uh, to a oh, point, yeah. so, so I'm not yep. sure how willing people are to change their application to mm. port it to, to a lightweight yep. thread. But anyway, it's a possibility it's that some people might find useful. Uh, going back to this slide, so um, software prefetching. Why is that important? Because um, if you could bring in advance, uh, I mean, you need to read some data structure, right? So um, <coughs> since you have like those data structures might be uh, uh, belonging to a flow, uh, or they might be belong to a packet. So it depends on how many of them you have. Probably most of the time, like if that's per packet or it's per flow and you have millions of flows, you have big tables, those won't be in cache. So it makes actually a big difference uh, where you find that thing, right? Because if you read it from L1, L2 cache, it will take a few cycles. If you read it from memory, it will take hundreds of cycles. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to bring that stuff closer uh, to you, prepare in, uh, 
preparation for the moment when you, you will actually read it. So the recommendation is as soon as you know that you are going to read address x or variable x, then prefetch that cache line closer to the CPU, so typically L1 cache. So hence you have these software prefetching instructions. Um, the next thing here is obviously we need to process packets in bulk in bursts. We don't process one packet at a time. We talked about this in the previous days. Like uh, there is a, a, a fixed cost, for example, for Polmo drivers, you need to, to go and do an MMIO uh, write, for example. So that's a fixed cost that you can pay per packet if you do one packet at a time, or you can pay it per burst of packets because you only need to update it once for, for the, for the uh, vector of packets. So then bigger the vector is, the, uh, the cost per packet will drop. So that's, that's one reason to, to process packets in bulk. There is also another reason here, or maybe a, a few other more reasons. So one reason that I saw <coughs> while writing these micro pipelines of instructions um, is that if you could actually process several packets at a time, if you could actually unroll that loop, then you will loosen up dependencies between instructions because at least the Intel CPU is running out of order. So, so then if you give compiler more instructions to more scope that, uh, to optimize, you have basically the same work do, uh, done on several packets. Then you have more instructions that the compiler can optimize and also the CPU execution pipeline can also reorder in such a way. So if you need to read something and the CPU will detect that, okay, that read is a dependent read, uh, it will, it will uh, stall, then it will actually, if you have more instructions, you will execute those instructions first that are not dependent on the result. So then it's more room to maneuver here. So that's another very important thing is if you, if you do this in the right way, you will loosen up dependencies between instructions and the CPU pipeline will stall less. Yeah. This goes hand in hand with the next one, which is branchless code. So why is it important to write branchless code? It's about the same reason because, uh, I mean, we do have uh, hardware branch predictors in the CPU. They work better or worse I mean, it depends on how you write the code. Sometimes the CPU does a great job to predict those instructions, those, those branches, whether they go left or they go right. Sometimes we, uh, we use these likely, unlikely macros or whatever, expect. I think it's built-in expect zero, built-in expect one, uh, GCC or compiler uh, built-ins. Um, sometimes what we think is the way they will get executed is the right way. Sometimes we do it incorrectly. So sometimes when we use this likely, unlikely, or uh, built-in expects, we might actually do more harm than good. <laughs> so I, I, I see people that say, yeah, we should use them. We should use them as, as much as possible. I see other people saying, no, you should not use them because you are actually making things worse. Um, so I don't know where the truth is. Um, and this needs to be uh, uh, determined empirically. So maybe go now to this slide over here. So we talked about uh, ping pong of cache lines and we talked about branch mispredictions, right? So why, why, why is it important to, to write branchless code? Because if you, the CPU will try to predict that branch and if it will actually predict it in the wrong way, there is a penalty. Why is that? So if you start pushing and going left and executing that stream of instructions that is for going left and it's actually incorrect, then at some point you need to flush the whole CPU pipeline. You need to say, whoa, whoa, stop. We, I got it the wrong way, you'll detect that and you need to rewind. So you'll need to say, okay, I need to discard whatever I did in the last number of instructions when I turned left. 
So that actually has a penalty, obviously, which is proportional to how deep the CPU pipeline is. So for Intel CPUs, according to our optimization reference manual, which I encourage everybody to read, it's only 600 pages, <laughs> which is much less than the complete manual, which is like the manual with everything, with the instructions, which is 2,000 pages. So you can take this. I'm reading this myself. So uh, <clears throat> just to understand better how the cache hierarchy works and uh, all, th all these tricks. So just, just Google for Intel manual and int or, or Intel optimization manual. Download that. And whenever you have half an hour, just read <laughs> a few more pages. <laughs> MJ is a great supporter of uh, reading that manual as well. So that's what the manual says. It's about, the cost is about 20 cycles. Obviously, it's not going to always be 20 cycles. Could be less. Probably it could be more as well, depending on a number of things that happen in, that, in the CPU, like um, whether you have those instructions in your iCache, whether they are decoded or not. So, so that's the, uh, the way it is. Uh, in terms of accesses, memory accesses, and in terms of penalty for the cache miss. As I was saying, uh, <coughs> reading from L1 or L2 cache, so just, just maybe to, to level set first, we do have several CPU sockets right on the same board. They are connected through QPI, and I think there is a, the, on the next generation, the name is KPI, KTI, or Whatever. <laughs> so they are connected to, together. Why they are connected together is for coherency reasons, right? Because all of them will see the same address space. And um, a, a, on this CPU, you can actually access um, uh, an address which is located in the memory attached to a remote CPU, right? So, uh, so everything needs to be coherent. Everything, all the CPUs need to know whether that cache, who owns that cache line? What's the state of that cache line, right? <clears throat> Hope that's, that's clear enough for people. So we have this memory attached to each of the CPUs. Usually, you, you will configure that symmetrically. When you build your board, you will kind of uh, hook up uh, the same amount of memory to each CPU socket. So you'll have a, a symmetric setup. That probably is not uh, uh, always uh, happening, and maybe there are asymmetrical setups as well. Um, and, and then within each CPU, you have a number of CPU cores. All these cores are sharing the last level cache, which is uh, the order of magnitude is dozens of megabytes. I think on the latest Intel CPUs, I think we have 30, 40 megs of last level cache. Um, but then each CPU core also has private cache. And that's like 32K of instruction cache, 32K of um, uh, data cache. That's a level one cache. And then you have a level two cache, which is 256K, which is unified instruction and data. So bottom line, you have some shared cache, which is last level cache. And you have some private cache, which is L1 and L2. So this is what this table says. Um, if you basically miss in L1 or L2 of your core, like you are core, uh, core number five, and you are looking for a variable, for, for, a, for let's say, an address. You don't have that cache line in your private cache, but you find it in last level cache. So then you have two cases, whether that line is um, clean, is um, So I think uh, the first line says, if that line is not used by anybody else, uh, either for read or write right now. So then that's, that's like straightforward. You just happen to find it in there. It's 42 cycles. So it's much more than the cost to read from L1 or L2 cache, which is 3, 4 cycles for L1 and 10, 12 cycles for L2. It's three times more. So it actually makes sense to prefetch something even if you hope or you know, of course, you know probabilistically, like with the probability of 80%, let's say, that thing is in L3 cache. 
it's not in memory, it's in L3 cache. It still makes sense to prefetch it. The minute you know this, the, the cycle, you know that you will need that, prefetch that. Because it will save you from a few cycles to 40 cycles. It will save you a lot of cycles. OK, uh, then things complicate. Uh, if that line is actually shared between multiple cores, multiple cores read the same cache line. And this is shared, so, so it's not modified. If it's modified, then it means that it's actually in the L3 cache, but it's also in the private L1, L2 cache of a different core. So this is the difference between rows 2 and 3. So as you see, this penalty actually grows. If the line is shared, it's like 50% more penalty versus the case where the line is actually in the exclusive state. This is governed by the Messi protocol. Modified, exclusive, exclusive shared, invalid. invalid. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so 63 cycles, and then it goes to 73 cycles. So that, that grows, right? Uh, <clears throat> then if your cache line you are looking for is in the remote last level cache of a different CPU, then it doubles again. And, and then whether it's, if it's in memory, it's like yet another order of magnitude difference. Uh, th this is a question really for this guy. I mean, he knows CPUs, but as to the first bit valid, I mean not, not the whole row coming back, right? Because you're going to fill the line. You're going to fill the way. So everything goes in cache lines, OK? Yeah. You, you, you read one bit. You, get the, you have to get the whole cache uh -huh. line into your L1 cache. Right, and so 64 you, have to, you, have bytes, the, bits. you have to run the RAS and, and strobe the, the memory. Yeah, right? absolutely, okay. yeah. So that, that goes through the controller. OK. Yeah, right. OK, so just to finalize this, um, the last two things that I have on this list, which is pretty much maybe same things said in a different way, like exactly what Damian just said, avoid sharing the data structures between cores. So like if you look in the Linux network stack, I mean, maybe one of the reasons, architectural reasons why it's maybe limited in performance at some point is because everything is kind of shared. Any packet can go to any CPU. Any CPU can do any processing. There is no split up. Anybody can do anything on any packet at any given time. So then you have to potentially log every time you access any anything. So uh, even if most of the time that lock will not be taken, but there is a penalty to actually ask for the lock even if the lock is not taken. So, so then avoid, I mean, the way you build your data structures, and I would say what DPDK is about is how you write your code, and uh, most of it is how you design your data structures. So, and if you design it in the wrong way, then you will get the wrong performance. If you, Try to avoid sharing as much as possible. Even if you have tables like a flow table, maybe you can divide it per worker. You could say, OK, these flows will be handled by this worker, these other flows by this other worker. You don't need to that all the workers will see all the flows. So because at that point, uh, you will have to lock. You might have to implement a lock typically on every uh, entry in the table. So you don't want to do that. So what, uh, and it's not about just locking. It's also about the ping pong of cache lines. It's exactly what Damian said. Um, you have counters. Each, each CPU will have its own counter, number of packets received, OK? Uh, if you put those two counters on the same cache line, then obviously that cache line will go from one core to the other. This guy is asking for it to read it and update it. This other guy is asking for the same cache line. You don't have to lock because you are not updating the same variable, but you are updating the same cache line. So don't do that. <laughs> Think about this carefully when you design your data structures and align your data structures to cache line sizes per CPU, per CPU data structures. Don't align any variable on the cache line size. <laughs> Only uh, data structures that are per CPU, they should be aligned to the cache size. Uh, obviously, using inline functions will, uh, will help. So now, 
my plan was to kind of go, I'm not sure how much time we still have. About 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay, I'll take half an hour. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I have a few examples here on how to to, ranch, uh, to write like branchless code, and how to use to do prefetch pipelines. So maybe maybe I'll start with this one over here. Um, we could look in the code as well. You could do that offline yourself as well. This is a, a, a hash table that is implemented as part of libRT table. So in DPDK, for some historical reason, we do have multiple implementations of hash tables. Some people know about them. Most of the people don't. So um, when I was uh, designing the packet framework thing, I realized that it's critical to have a good high-performance high hash table. So what that really does is you need to read some key from the packet. You need to extract some key from the packet or packet metadata. You need to apply a hash function to get a digest or a signature. And that would be used to indicate your bucket. And uh, then uh, you will need to go and look into that bucket. You need to compare the, the key against several keys, all the entries you have in the bucket. And then you need to go to the data. I mean, the data could actually be a pointer, as, as Dave said, just a pointer on, or on opaque 64-bit field. In, in this implementation, actually, you, you can have data of any size. And we just pre prefetch the beginning of, of that uh, data. We could also prefetch the pointer in case this is an opaque value. But we actually prefetch, we, we, we think that the data is included in that table. So. How do we how do we do that? Uh, you can you can look up the code. I'm not sure if I can quickly open it, but at the end of the day, it is it is like uh, it is a, um, like uh, several stages connected together, and they are data dependent because you cannot really start this stage before you completed the first stage, and you cannot go to stage two before you completed stage one. So how we, do we do this? Is we uh, simply handle multiple packets in parallel. So this pipeline would actually work with eight packets. If you look in the code, you will see that we actually test, do we have at least seven packets? Why seven packets? Exactly for the reason we talked yesterday. We can do a trick and, and clone if we uh, have an even number of, uh, if we have an odd number of packets, we can clone the last packet and just run with the last packet twice and then uh, avoid doing the commit operation, which is like writing or whatever. As long as you just do reads, you can do that. So if you look in the code, what we do is, do we have at least seven packets? If not, then we just run a slow version of this, of this function, of this lookup function. This is all about the lookup, because adding entries, deleting entries, not that critical. So and then each stage will actually run with two different packets. Um, why two packets? Because more packets you have, you have like a better chance to, to loosen up the dependency between instructions. And each of these stages is actually, uh, it, 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 it uh, finishes on the boundary of a prefetch. So each stage is defined by a prefetch operation. So for example, in here, you need to, 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 um, to detect, okay, this is, the place where I need to, to extract my key from. OK, I need to prefetch that. So prefetch that, uh, uh, that packet or that metadata in the embuff. So these stages are not exactly even in terms of processing. But that's the way it is. Because for example, in the first stage, we don't really do much. We just uh, do some very light computation, and we just launch the prefetches. In the second stage, we start doing more work. Because we, uh, we need to apply the hash function to identify the bucket. We need to go into the bucket. Now we need to prefetch the bucket. So we, we understand, as soon as we understand, we need to go to read that thing. We stop, we do the prefetch, and we switch to another stage in that for loop. So why, what, how is that helping? We do other stage, we do some other work, but on a different 
on two different packets. So this would loosen up the dependencies because now that prefetch could work. You allow the prefetch to execute for these two packets while you are doing work for these two other packets. Once you are ready with whatever you need to do here, which is less important uh, for our discussion, for the purpose of the discussion, then you will do the prefetch in here and then you will swap to here, which is just once you understand the data that which is the winner entry within that bucket, you will prefetch the data for the user. I mean, you can look into the code. It's, uh, it's built, built up this way. Let me talk a bit about uh, uh, the next example, which is um, how to do the, the, uh, uh, the scheduling, the hierarchical scheduling. And what, uh, the way this is implemented in DPDK right now. So, I mean, we don't really have time now to talk about the requirements and how the hierarchical scheduler work. But in, in a, few, uh, a few words, it's like a five level hierarchy. Uh, the first level is the top level is the port, the output port. Then you have like slices of ports that we call subports. And then uh, the support is like a group of users. Then the next level, the third level is the pipe, what we call pipe level. We have thousands of pipes now that are uh, part of the same port. So in each support, we probably have hundreds to thousands, so a lot of pipes per support. The, the pipe is really your subscriber, your user, your flow, whatever. It's like one traffic stream, let's say. And, uh, and then uh, we have traffic classes four traffic classes uh, for each of the pipes. So each user could actually have voice and uh, video like high priority traffic, then could have best effort traffic, which is the lowest priority. We have four traffic uh, classes defined. And then within each traffic class, we have four queues. You can look at them as sub traffic classes. So in total, you have like 16 sub traffic classes for each user. And uh, uh, on the last level, you have some weights between these queues. You could uh, you do, you do a byte level weighted round robin, which is actually weighted fair queuing for four queues, for each traffic class. So, why am I telling you this? Because the um, this was one of the impossible problems to solve on uh, in software, on the CPU side, without hardware support. But we did some progress. We did significant progress on it. So. How does this work? You can look at this scheduler object, which is attached to each output port, like uh, a big reservoir of packets. You have thousands of queues here, which are like uh, the bottom level of the hierarchy, uh, an array of queues where you put packets, scheduling queues. They, they are internal to this object, to this big reservoir of packets. Uh, logically, they are organized into a tree, into this hierarchy. But and at each level of hierarchy, you have like some requirements, some constraints, like either uh, a rate limiting using token buckets for port and pipe, uh, or you have strict priority between traffic classes or weighted fair queuing be between the queues within the same traffic class. So um, how did we implement this? Um, you have basically two interfaces, one input interface, one output interface into this traffic manager or hierarchical scheduler. On the input side, you basically just put packets as they are received. You just put them into whatever queue, whichever queue they belong to. The classification stage typically will tell you, OK, this packet belongs to this flow. Uh, it's uh, part of this traffic class based on the DSCP code point of the input packet or the color or whatever. And uh, it needs to go to this support, uh, to this pipe, to this traffic class, to this queue. So that's probably the job of the classification stage. So packets come in, you ha they have this information in their metadata. Uh, the in queue step, or the, uh, the input step will simply put the packets into whatever queues they belong to. It will also do uh, the, the tail drop or um, uh, it will, uh, for congestion management, so whenever the queue is full, you will have to drop the packet. Um, or you will do some smarter mechanism. What was the name of that feature that I'm, uh, I'm missing right now? Yes, weighted red. Uh, 
so a smarter way to do congestion management, you don't need to wait until the last moment the queue is full to drop the packets because you will have a massive drop global congestion. You will actually prefer, it works great for TCP, to drop just one packet once in a while just to, to slow down the source of the TCP traffic. So you can do red on the EQ side as well. On the DQ, it works based on the rules of the hierarchy, based on the SLA, right? So um, the way we did it, we implemented, we have a bitmap. You guys have a bitmap, we also have a bitmap. <laughs> we spend a lot of time, I mean, I'm not sure how you use uh, the bitmap. In, in, in our case, uh, this was the reason we uh, created the bitmap. And the key operation here is to detect the next queue that is non-empty. Detect the next bit that is set in a huge array of bits. Like each queue has its own bit, which tells you whether the queue is empty or, or non-empty. So like imagine an array of 4K bits. Just hunt the next bit that is set. And uh, uh, we hunt it in groups of 16 because we have 16 queues per pipe. We basically try to see the next pipe that is non-empty, that has at least one queue that ha which has packets. So get me the next group of 16 bits that has at least one bit set. So this is what that bitmap will do. So then um, this is a data dependent problem because in order to, to take the scheduling decision per packet, you need to read all this information like, okay, what's the, uh, the status of credits on my uh, port? What's the status of my, on my support? What the, what's the status on... Uh, uh, my traffic class, uh, the packet belongs to, and each of the queues. So you need a massive amount of data to be brought into cache to read it in order to take this scheduling decision. Am I going to be allowed to pick the packet from this queue and send it out, yes or not? So you can probably already see the prefetches, <laughs> prefetches flying around, right? So we need to, do one, to read something to understand what to read next. And each of these is, can be split into a state machine, really. Each of these stages is like um, determined, defined by a prefetch operation. But now you have like uh, this massive amount of, of pipes. Uh, so what we do is we have this notion of grinders. I mean, this is a name that we picked. So what this means, a grinder is the state machine for a pipe. So once we pick a pipe, we kind of work with, let's say, uh, 16 pipes. I think the number of grinders is 16 in the code, or eight, I don't remember exactly. So it doesn't really matter. You work with 16 pipes at a time, and you have a state machine for each of these pipes. So what we do is we run a stage of the state machine for th the current pipe, uh, we do whatever we need to do to understand what to read next. We launch the prefetch, and then we don't wait. We switch to a different pipe, to a different grinder. And we, pick, we see, okay, where is it that we left this grinder? It's probably a different stage than the previous grinder. We do whatever we need to do next, the next prefetch, and then we switch again to another pipe. So eventually we get back to the same pipe, and we push it one step further. At some point, packets will start dropping from here. You will actually schedule packets. You'll say, yes, you have credits, you have packets, you have everything, send the packet. And then we combine, like we collect all these packets for all these grinders for the same output port. So this is, if you look in the code, you'll actually see that this grinder is, a, okay, you'll see the bitmap implementation, which is optimized for reading 64 bit words, reading cache lines, hunting for the next bit using special instructions, a built in uh, find first bit set. <laughs> yeah. So you said uh, the bitmap indicates each queue, whether it has, it's empty or not empty. Yes. So is, is it just one packet deep, that queue? It's, it's one bit, so you have a queue where you store packets. You, if it's non-empty, you have at least one packet in that queue. You could, ha could have more. Okay. So basically, the in-queue process, every time it will successfully write a packet to that queue, it will set the bit, and, and then the DQ process, whenever it uh, uh, read the last packet of the queue, it will reset that bit. Oh, so that's basically for the scheduler to pick up packets from yes. that queue based on exactly. the tokens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's a 
the grinder is a prefetch state machine. That's yet another example in TPDK where you have this massive reliance on prefetch state machines. So just for you guys, I mean, we, I had to write a lot of documentation for this because this is what I read right now. I wrote this code four years ago, so I don't remember it. <laughs> now you guys want to, <laughs> to use it in VPP? Okay, we'll do the best. I will do my best. I will read my own manual <laughs> because, I mean, I don't have all these details in my mind. I, I encourage people to read this and use it as an example on how you could actually, uh, it's an extreme case for these uh, prefetch state machines. And I have yet another, maybe the last example. Uh, see if I can open. Um, so this is part of the same hash example thing. Um, we have a bucket with uh, the, the way the, the, uh, the hash table works. This hash table works is like each bucket starts with a group of four entries, which is basically four keys and four data, user data as part of the bucket. If you need, you can extend that bucket. You can, if you, if you need to add another key to the same bucket, you will allocate another group of four entries and you will chain them together. So it's like a, a linked list of groups of four, four, uh, four keys. Uh, so as part of this, we uh, have to, uh, given an input key, we have to compare it with the four keys in the bucket, in the group. And, um, we try to write branchless code. So these ifs over here are hopefully C moves, conditional moves. So they are Intel instructions. It's not going to be a branch. But at some point, uh, I mean, what could happen is you could have, it most typically, you have one match out of, you have input key matching exactly one of those four keys in the bucket. Um, sometimes you have more matches. Sometimes you don't have any match. So then you have these three things that you want to determine, whether you have at least one match, whether you have more than one match, and what's the match position. In the case you have one, it's straightforward. When you have several matches, uh, you just pick the first one, okay? Um, so how do you write this without, I mean, you have like three things and typically you would do a switch statement or whatever, uh, a lot of ifs here to kind of set this these flags based on this. So I kind of created a, a lookup table here. Uh, and the way it, it was created is really, uh, I mean, I thought that it's a bad idea. It definitely, I thought it's a good idea. It definitely helps performance. Um, you can create a lookup table and you can compress this table into just one integer or three integers. So given all these combinations of the results, because this mask basically means which of the entries actually have a match. One, 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 one means that all the four keys in the bucket are matching the input keys, which, uh, yeah. Okay, so you end up with this lookup table thing and you can compress this into some integers really. And, and then you can just shift based on, on, uh, on the position in the code below and pick the bit that you need from this. So this was one way to actually um, avoid writing any branches. Just to do it, compute some things. I think uh, Dave showed a lot of other examples in VPP where you just do multiplication. With two, you take things, you shift them, whatever, to, just to avoid branches, avoid testing on a value. If you could compute the, uh, an index rather than just do if else is then that would benefit your code. You'll avoid those 20 cycles of branch mis misprediction penalty. So that's what I had. 